Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Lee, Democrats Abroad Greece, and one of the three co-leads of the Ohio team of Democrats Abroad. Our second co-lead is Nikki Vondervel. She's at the controls today. And the call was set up by our third co-lead, Angela Fobbs, who's on a train somewhere in Germany as we speak. Other core Ohio team members are in the call. You'll meet some of them later, I think, as well as a few friends from around the world and, I hope, on the ground in Ohio. So let's get acquainted. Just take a few minutes to type into the chat where you're joining the call from, where you vote, if you don't vote in Ohio, and if you're affiliated with any group or caucus that you'd like to mention, please do so at the same time. And I'm going to see if I can get to the end and hit enter. There's mine. And you all can go ahead and type in. Today's call was spearheaded by the Democrats Abroad Veterans and Military Families Caucus. That's the VMF Caucus. They reached out to the Ohio team because House Bill 458 passed by the Republican trifecta and signed into law by Governor DeWine back in the lame duck session in December, um, it hits all of us. It hits military and civilians alike, all of us who are abroad. Now, our Republican Secretary of State likes to brag about the clean, secure elections he runs. He even said that when certain members of his own party claimed that the 2022 elections were rigged. And then came 458 which we'll hear more about from our guest presenters. But it begs the question, doesn't it? Whatever happened to that old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? I think we know the Republican answer to that. But that's what we'll be hearing about today with time for Q&A. So get your questions ready. And when the time comes, we'll tell you to put your hand up in the chat and ask those questions. Now, our Dems Abroad International Vice Chair, Art Shankler, has a few words of encouragement. Art's Ohio born and raised, and he's been with us for every one of our Ohio team calls since last year. So once again, back by popular demand, Art Shankler. Art? Well, thanks, Karen. I, I don't know how popular and how much of a demand, but thanks. I'm glad <laughs> to be here. As you know, I grew up in Akron, and I still feel very much in Ohio, and even though I, I now vote in New York. Uh, I, I want to welcome all of our participants from around the world, and especially our special guests from Ohio who are going to speak to us. You know, when I was growing up, the phrase was, as Ohio, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. Well, I hope in the legislation that we're going to hear about today, I hope that's not the case, and I hope we'll be able to reverse the tide. You know, Karen, when you say about, uh, you know, running a clean election, you know, I think this legislation that we're going to hear about today is confirmation that the Republicans know that they are in the minority. It's something I've been saying for a while. They know they're in the minority on all the issues that matter to the American people, on reproductive rights, on voting rights, on gun safety. They are in the minority and they are afraid to have an open election. And they respond to this by gerrymandering their districts so that they keep control of legislatures in states like Ohio and in states like Wisconsin, where they get a minority of the vote and yet they have almost a two thirds majority in their state house. And voter suppression is their other you know, main tool that if they keep people from voting, they figure they might have a chance to win. And I hope we're going to hear more about the, you know, the horrible legislation. They're trying to raise the, uh, the threshold for approving a state constitutional amendment, you know, designed to prevent Ohioans from voting for reproductive rights, because they know if it was an open vote under the current constitution, they would lose and there would be a constitutional amendment. The same for, you know, the issues about voter ID that we're going to hear about for HB 4, 458 and, you know, requirements for mailing your ballot back and the timing, you know, that's going to affect both military voters and us overseas. And I'm looking forward to hearing, I don't know if anybody's looked at this, you know, we've seen uh, this year a lot of elections that are just state elections. You know, for example, up in Wisconsin, they had state elections last month you know, for the Supreme Court justice and for the legislature. And those elections, was, or state elections, are not subject 
to uh, control by, you know, what we call Yokava, uh, the law that governs voting rights for Americans overseas and military voters who are outside of their state. So it will be interesting to see whether if they pass this, le or they have passed this legislation, where things like voter ID will be applied in state-only elections for us who live overseas. So with that, I will turn it over to, is it Andrew, I think? Uh, whoever's next. And I, again, I welcome you all, and I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion today. Karen, who's next? I am. Oh, okay. I am. Okay. Yeah. Key, key, key. I know yeah. you're giving introductions. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Art. Uh, hello, and welcome to everyone. Um, I'm Key Evans. I'm the chair of the Democrats Abroad Global Veterans and Military Families Caucus. I live in La Antigua, Guatemala, Guatemala, and vote in New Mexico. Um, the VMF Caucus has over 1,100 members all over the world and from every state in the US. 21 of our members are Ohio voters, and I see several of you here. Our members represent the diversity that makes up the America that we know and love, regardless of ancestry, sexual orientation, race, gender, religion, ethnicity, age, veteran status, color, marital status, sexual identity, we will welcome and represent you. Discrimination has no place in our caucus, in Democrats abroad, or our country. We encourage and help everyone to vote and uphold and adhere to the principles of the Democratic Party. Ohio HB 458, affects all Ohio voters, military and civilians alike. Other states could enact that same legislation and we cannot let that happen. We will advocate for you um, with anything you need from VNF. We're here for you. And thank you and I will now turn this over to Andrew Anderson, who is the secretary of the VMF caucus. Thank you, Key. Hope everybody can hear me. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I've got the distinct pleasure of introducing the two speakers for today. Uh, first, Ms. Uh, Connie Pillage, and then Mr. Zach Roberts. Just as a quick introduction, there's a bio in the information that was sent out earlier, but I just wanna craft it up for Ms. Pillage. Ms. Pillage is the chair of the Ohio Democratic VMF caucus and the vice chair of the, of the DNC VMF Council. She's an Air Force veteran and is an Ohio Dems point person for the UOCAVA voting. In addition, Ms. Pillage is a former state legislator, a lawyer with a distinguished career, member of the Ohio, Cincinnati and Women's Bar Associations, presented before the Ohio Supreme Court, member of many groups and organizations serving veterans and military families, and is inducted into the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. With that, then I'd like to move over to Zach Robert as a bio real quick. Mr. Rack, Zach Roberts serves as a vice chair of the Ohio Democratic Party Veterans and Military Community Caucus. Post 9-11 veteran, still serving in the Ohio National Guard as an E-7 Master Sergeant and is a non-commissioned officer in charge of a CONUS base team that responds to large scale incidents. And with that, I'd like to uh, warmly welcome both to this uh, meeting. Thank you. Key, back to you. Uh, so that's all I have. So, um, Nikki, uh, back to you. <laughs> Great. Actually, I would say, uh, Ms. Pillage, if you're ready, I know you said that you have a presentation. If you want to put that up and then afterwards I can pin both you and Zach so that you're in the forefront for the speakers. Um, we have you on mute. Yeah, I saw it. There we go. The most uh, commonly uttered words on Zoom are, you're on mute, right? So that's because we all forget. So thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Zach and I are very excited to be talking about the issues that are on the ground in Ohio. And not surprisingly, we didn't, uh, our Republican Party probably did not invent the measures that they're pushing. 
There's our think tanks across the, the country that create model legislation and they just start selling it to different states. And that's why you see the same things being introduced all over the place. So as, who was it? Was it Art who introduced me? Yeah, I, I did serve in the Air Force eight years. I joined because I wanted to see the world. And right away, I went to Biloxi, Mississippi and Grand Forks, North Dakota. Yeehaw, yeehaw. So for the, so I saw two ends of the country that most people never have been to and never will go to. But um, so I did serve in support of Desert Storm. That was the era in which I was on active duty. And after I got out of the military, I went back to school, got my law degree. I worked as a public defender for about six years before I opened my own law firm. In whoa, oh, hundred years ago in two thousand eight, I got elected to the state legislature. I served three terms. Mine was a pretty tough district. Uh, they redrew the lines in, in the middle of my service and made it harder. But you know, I had a lot of I had a lot of help and a lot of uh, good people on my team, and we persevered. And in 2014, I ran for Ohio Treasurer of State, so I have statewide campaign experience as well. So I have been active really at every level of the Democratic Party from the precinct ex executive in my community here in my little neighborhood. I co-chaired our county party for a while, and now I'm at the state level as the chair of the Veterans and uh, Military Community Caucus. Last year, I got elected to serve as vice chair for communications of the DNC's Veterans and Military Families Council. And that is pretty interesting to get to do that. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I'm very excited that I learned how to use Google Slides. And I'm gonna minimize that and I'm gonna start my slideshow. So we're here really to talk about threats to voting in Ohio. And this, this uh, of course involves every Ohio voter who lives abroad, every military member from Ohio who is stationed abroad. And it's going to affect all of us because, like I said, these laws are not invented in Ohio. They just are being worked through here today. So today I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the General Assembly, just to familiarize you with it and talk about the attack on voting rights. And Zach Roberts will talk about the next challenges to democracy in Ohio. Uh, unfortunately, there are many. So Ohio, let's see, go, go. Ohio has a bicameral legislature. We have a House of Representatives. We have a Senate. And they meet year round. We're one of, I think, eight states where the General Assembly meets all year. Most states, they meet 60 to 90 days every second year. But we have lots of more, lots more time for introducing mischief in the General, in the general Assembly. We do have, um, our oh, bills have to pass both chambers and be signed by the governor in order to become law. So our elections, like everybody else, we have a general election in November. We have our primary in May, most of the time, every now and then we switch it. And we have the opportunity for a special election in August. We've usually seen that for school board races, school levies, township, property rights uh, increases, things like that. And that brings us to House Bill 458. This was introduced uh, uh, purely to eliminate August elections. It was introduced in October of 2021, and it pretty much sat around doing nothing for over a year, for about 13 months. It did pass easily with bipartisan support. The few people that did testify about it to the few uh, outside people were the elections officials, some um, board of elections people, some big town mayors. Uh, the only opposition was some of the townships who like to use the August election and it's very, very low turnout so they could pass a levy of some sort. But it did pass easily, but it took 13 months to get out of committee and to get through the House. So the Senate took it up in um, 
November of 2022. And they made sweeping changes. And there were dozens of people and organizations that testified against it. In spite of all those concerns, uh, they rammed it through in lame duck and uh, the governor signed it. So instead of um, to having much to do with the August election, it's all about voter identification. Now we have a voter ID in Ohio. We've had it for a long time. And, um, but it's pretty easy to, to handle. You can bring a copy of your lease. You can bring your utility bill, a government document with your address on it, anything to prove that you lived where you live. And we've not had uh, a photo ID. But here's what this bill does. It removes certain forms of identification uh, so that you can no longer use them in Ohio. So again, your government document, your lease, your mortgage, our utility bill, a county issue issued veterans identification card. These ID cards, by the way, were authorized by the General Assembly just a few years ago. And now it requires a photo ID in order to vote. We've never had photo ID before, and we have it now. So uh, the, the, the acceptable forms of ID are very limited. You can use your driver's license. You can get a state ID card at the Bureau of Mo Motor Vehicles. And these, could, these are free if you can get to the BMV. You can use your US passport, which does not have your address on it. Or you can use something called Veterans Affairs Identification Card. The bill doesn't define what this is. And if you go on the VA website, it has a Veterans Affairs Veteran ID card, but it doesn't have a Veterans Affairs Identification on it. Uh, card on it. So, you know, that could be misconstrued as your pass to get into the VA, your employee pass. Um, the other thing it does is it reduces the time to return your absentee ballot. I bet everyone on this call votes absentee. It reduces the time by 60%. So this begs the question, how do voters learn about this bill? Well, when Georgia and Missouri enacted voter ID, pardon me, photo ID laws in 2010, Here's my first typo. I noticed they spent $30 million or, and $17 million, respectively, to educate voters about the new requirements. And here are some of the things they did. 15 months of robust outreach. 15 months. 5 million pieces sent through di direct mail or put into utility bills. 57,000 pieces to organizations such as chambers of commerce, churches, and libraries. 83,500 automated phone calls. I don't think anybody will answer those nowadays, but back in 2010, people still answered their phone. 1,200 video PSAs, those were broadcast on TV. 60,000 radio PSAs, 70 news releases. One thing I didn't include is they even flew uh, Blue airplanes with a, a streamer behind it uh, over the football games. So here's what voters, Ohio's voter education plan is. Absolutely nothing. I'm trying to switch my slide. There we go. So House Bill 458 will have a real life impact. And we know this because we have members of our caucus, our Veterans Caucus, who have voted from an overseas military posting. One of our guys was deployed to the Middle East and he voted. He mailed his ballot on time and then he tracked it to see how long it took to get there. It arrived eight days after election day. When he voted, his ballot was counted because before this bill, you had 10 days to get your ballot. Your ballot had to arrive within 10 days. You have to mail it before election day. It has to arrive within 10 days. His got there eight days. Under this new law, his ballot would have been thrown out. Now, 
I was overseas for a vacation not long ago, and I sent some postcards from Australia to the United States. Let's see, I mailed it on March 28th. It still has not arrived, and it's April 30th. So I know how long it can take to get mail from overseas to the U.S. When I was serving overseas, I voted from, I was stationed in uh, West Berlin. I voted from there. We were able to use the Army Post Office. It only takes a regular stamp. This is one of the benefits we get when we're posted uh, in a different country. And it used to take about 10 days for my parents to get letters. Now, this was so long ago. That's when we only wrote letters. So nobody knew about, uh, we didn't have real email back then. So what can we do? So the first thing you can do is you can contact your legislator. I'm going to post the links here. And um, Nikki, if you want me to put them in the, in the um, chat, I'll do that too. So you can find your state representative. You can find your state senator. You click one of those links, scroll down, and you can just enter your address. For those of you who, I don't know how you do it when you're a dem abroad, uh, an, an, an expat abroad. I don't know how you have an address, but this is where you find your state senator. Maybe use someone in your family. So you can contact them and tell them this is garbage. You need to fix this. You can also write to our Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, himself an Army veteran, to ask about robust voter education. I looked in his budget. There's nothing in the budget to pay for voter education of any kind. Nothing. Now, there's a couple different ways you can contact him because they don't say contact Sec Secretary LaRose on the website, but I'll put all this stuff in the chat. There's an elections division, and get this, there's an election integrity unit. How about that? And then you can call his office. That's probably the, the general office. It might be the switchboard, but that's the number they gave. So I think that is my last slide. So I'm going to stop sharing. So as you can see, we are in dire straits, <coughs> pardon me, in dire straits when it comes to anyone voting from outside, well, voting absentee. Uh, most places in Ohio, the mail will come within three to five days, but that's not enough time for your absentee ballot to get there even if you live and vote from your home in Ohio. But it's even more difficult for people who vote overseas. So, uh, and there is absolutely no um, plan to educate any voters anywhere in Ohio or elsewhere about these changes. So we're up in arms at that. We've had, we've been fortunate that we've been getting some good press. Uh, we've, we've flooded the governor's office with phone calls and emails and uh, filled up his answering machine several times before he signed the bill. He still signed it. I think he wrote me back saying, you know, this is a really good thing for Ohio. We got to have secure elections. Nobody thought our elections were insecure in Ohio because Trump won here probably, but no one thought they were insecure. Even the secretary of state said our elections were very good. And then, and all the secretaries of state for, I'd say, 15 years have said the same thing. The name of the bill again is House Bill 458. I'll put it in H Bill 458 from the 134th General Assembly. So they passed it. So our lame duck is um, after election day of an even numbered year. And so they rammed it through in, in the middle of the night as well to get it, get it out and get it to the governor's desk in time for him to sign it. Other questions? And I'm going to, when I get a moment, I'll find those links. And maybe when Zach's talking, I'll find those links and put them in the chat. I'm open for questions. Really fast. Yep. We're going to do star star hand up, just like Art Schinkler did um, for asking your questions. And please make sure to keep them brief and direct. Go for it, me, Nikki. Yep, go for it, Art. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, and thanks very much, uh, Connie. Uh, disturbing, but excellent introduction to the bill. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, in under Yokava laws, uh, overseas voters and military who vote that way are not required. It specifically says no ID requirement can be made. Is is there any suggestion of how absentee ballots will be fulfilling that ID requirement and whether they're going to try to figure out how to apply it to us in some way? They don't require, that's a great question. So the this bill does not change anything with regard to what you complete, what you fill out on your absentee ballot. So you still have to um, fill out your ballot and then you're going to have you put it in an envelope and then you write your name and stuff like that on the envelope. You have, still have to complete that fully and then you put it in the mail. Put that envelope into another envelope and mail it. So no changes to your ID. So, so, so they yet. won't be asking for an ID to put in the envelope? Not yet. Yeah. Correct. Makes even less, makes even I, less I sense, think it's actually. Coming. But, huh? but it I makes even less coming. sense if they require that people who show up in person to provide a photo ID, but people voting absentee don't. I, I don't. Anyway, good luck with all that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we had um, hundreds, hundreds of people voted over. Um, I want to say it was, and Zach might remember better, but I think it was 623 uh, military overseas ballots in the last presidential or general. I don't remember the last well, last, yeah. last regular well, it was election. Overseas, so, it was more than 5,000, I think. Or maybe yeah, but I'm just talking military. Yeah, no, I understand. Thanks. Yeah. So there was actually, I mean, and this is disputed because boards of election in Ohio are somewhat quasi-independent from the Secretary of State. So we had the Secretary of State's number, but um, boards of election were reporting out different numbers, just the reporting ran out of time on it. There was an analysis done and the Secretary of State's office said that there were, that number county that you mentioned, those were the actual people, those were the votes that would have been disenfranchised oh, okay. if, the new rules, if the new rules had been in place for the 22 midterm election. Um, however, in checking in with some of the larger counties across the state, it became actually clear to me and a couple other folks that the number was actually greater than a thousand. But um, public records requests that I put in December are still getting emailed to me now. Um, like last week, I had another county finally reply to a public record, public records request. So the long and the short of it is, is that no no education um, on these rules changes coupled with poor administration through military installations, through um, other organizations that do voter education on top of a ton of other uh, uh, obligations that they have, it's going to result in overseas voters because these rules have been poorly communicated out. We're going to see uh, voters, um, loot, you know, their ballots not count because of, you know, the multitude of reasons that cause delays in ballots being sent um, from abroad stateside. And that, and that regardless if you're using civilian mail or State Department or DOD uh, infrastructure, and this is a real problem. And uh, the powers that be just are waving it off and dismissing it out of hand, thinking that it's not important when obviously everybody on this call understands that that is indeed really important because everybody's entitled to their vote. Really fast before we go forward, Zach, would you like to go ahead and um, discuss your piece of the presentation and then we can go back to the questions because you might answer some of the questions that we sure. have. Yeah, so thank you everybody for giving us a little bit of time. I, I had a bit of a toddler emergency right before we went live. So I'm off camera uh, to, to protect the privacy of one of my children here, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking the responsibility of sharing with you some some updates about what's happening in the current General Assembly, the 135th General Assembly here in Ohio. Um, and right now, so House Bill 458, which is now law, uh, one of the components of that also eliminated special elections for August with certain exceptions. Um, and wouldn't you know, it's been a couple of months and all of a sudden they figured out a way to walk back their their voter protection and their, you know, good stewards of the taxpayer dollar in the state of Ohio by introducing legislation that would reintroduce 
uh, a special election in August of 2023 for the sole purpose of introducing a amendment that would make it more difficult for organizations to uh, bring forward citizen initiated constitutional amendments, raising the threshold of a simple majority 50% plus one to over 60%. Um, and if that wasn't a complicated enough, uh, there's a variation of this legislation circulating right now that would actually give the governor the ability to veto um, a constitutional amendment um, voted and passed uh, by, the, by the state of Ohio if the governor, for whatever reason, did not like the amendment. Um, so some background here. Uh, state of Ohio for over 100 years has had uh, a citizen initiated process for both state constitutional amendments as well as referendum. Came out of the progressive movement at the turn of the 20th century. Ohio has had this on its books for over 100 years and um, it, it's been uh, used uh, sparingly for its entirety. Um, there have been a couple of situations where some business interests have brought forward amendments, uh, one of which being the gambling industry brought gambling to Ohio after four attempts to modify the state constitution. Uh, the labor movement in Ohio um, most recently used it in 2006 to put forward a referendum to increase the state's minimum wage. So uh, this has not been used much. There are a couple of key examples that the uh, opponents like to raise up, but um, the reason why this is being introduced is because there are reproductive reproductive justice organizations in Ohio circulating language to enshrine uh, reproductive health access in the state constitution. They pulled petitions after election day in 2022 and have been circulating petitions in the state ever since. The requirements for a state constitutional amendment uh, to be put forward by citizens meets, has to meet a very high threshold. Uh, not only do you need to collect a minimum of 5% um, signatures in Ohio's 44 of 88 counties, you also need to uh, clear a threshold based off of the most recent turnout. So, to, and I'll happily share the links to all this so folks can read it for, their, for themselves, but basically what's going to be required of the reproductive justice organization's attempts is they're gonna need to collect over a million signatures before more or less the 4th of July of this year in order to get their amendment placed on the ballot. Um, there's no guarantee that they can meet that expectation of a tall order in a short window of time. And there's no guarantee that the state of Ohio will actually vote to affirm their amendment. That being said, the legislature is not leaving anything up to chance. Um, they tried to uh, push through this increased threshold from 50 to 60% in the lame duck session um, in November and December. And they were unapologetic in their advocacy for it. Then they made it very clear that this was about blocking uh, this reproductive health access legislation via state constitution, and they're trying to do it again. It was passed out of the Ohio Senate about a week and a half ago, and now it's making its way through the Ohio House. Um, uh, there are slight changes based on the two, and there, uh, there will be a conference committee if this does indeed pass out of the House, which we believe it will. And so what will ultimately happen is, um, by May 10th, um, we will likely see a special election that will cost the Ohio taxpayer $20 million to put on this single statewide constitutional amendment put forward by extremist Republicans in the legislature. Um, it will uh, not only increase the threshold from 50 to 60%, but it will also increase the signature requirements from 44 to all 88 counties. And uh, as someone who's done ballot initiative work as a profession, um, I will tell you that this is extraordinarily challenging and it will all but ensure that only business corporate interests, those with almost unlimited amounts of access for capital and resources of that kind, will be the ones being able to pursue uh, referendum, out, uh, sorry, constitutional amendments outside of the state legislature. So this, this is going to, if passed in August of 2023, will basically eliminate civic organizations, nonprofits ability to put things to the voters if the legislature fails to do its job and it will create a very easy pathway for uh, well-pocketed corporate uh, special interests to put their pet issues on the ballot. Um, so we, we have a tall uh, order ahead of us and a, and a big challenge. So um, Ohio's special election will be on August 8th, 2023. And uh, just to kind of wrap up here, uh, some of the vocal opponents of this uh, include the four living governors of Ohio before Mike DeWine. So 
John Kasich, Bob Taft, both Republicans, both two-term Republicans, uh, Ted Strickland, former one-term Democrat governor, and Dick Celeste, former two-term Democrat governor from the 80s, all came out, did individual and joint releases saying that this was dangerous and bad. Um, also, a uh, really concerning uh, piece of information that was uh, released uh, about the middle of last week uh, was the advocacy organization that represents the interests of all 88 boards of election. They uh, are ringing the alarm bells um, out of concern that they just, because of the elimination of the special election provision in the lame duck, they got rid of all their infrastructure. They were not built. They were not building, maintaining lists of uh, poll workers, voting locations that meet ADA and other requirements. Uh, that all this was mothballed or eliminated outright because they were told that they were no longer going to be doing August special elections. Well, don't you know, uh, they're staring down the barrel of the likelihood of needing to um, rebuild all of this within weeks. And they have told the legislature and the Secretary of State that they're incapable of doing this. Well, Frank LaRose doesn't seem to care what they have to say. And, by, and this is a bipartisan organization at that. So um, this is not only going to put a stress on our institutions uh, for the August special election, it's going to have a knock-on effect and really put uh, our county boards of election in a dangerous position of struggling to meet their obligations for the November elections as well, because they're going to be tapping resources, monetarily, uh, monetary resource, human capital, things of that nature to meet the August requirement. And then they're going to have to turn around and try and meet the requirement for the November elections of which in Ohio, is rather unique in this compared to the other uh, 49 states. We have all of our municipal elections with certain exceptions every odd year. So in Ohio, we have statewide elections and federal elections every, uh, you know, every four years on the even uh, on the even year of the calendar. But every odd year, that's where we have our city councils, our townships, school boards, of which there's over 700 of those alone in the state of Ohio. Uh, our, uh, we actually are looking at 6,000 races on the November ballot. And this is just going to compound our state's uh, challenges in meeting its constitutional requirement to provide safe and secure and fair elections across the state. So with that being said, I'll, 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 I'll breathe and I'll take any questions that anybody might have on this topic. Okay, really fast. We had uh, a queue of questions beforehand. Um, Key? Thank you. Um, Ohio accepts ballots uh, at absentee ballots only by mail. Guatemala, like many other Latin American countries, have unreliable post offices. If I mailed something from the Guatemala post office, it might reach the U.S. in a couple of weeks or a couple of months or maybe never. Um, Sending things to the U.S. by DHL or FedEx cost 60 U.S. dollars per pound or portion of a pound. So one envelope with your ballot in it will cost $60 to send. The U.S. Embassy will accept um, ballots to go by diplomatic pouch, but there is no set schedule with the embassy on when that pouch might go out. And then when the mail gets to the US, wherever it goes, the State Department somewhere, then it has to be mailed from there out to the States. Um, so allowing return of ballots by email would make a huge, huge difference for overseas voters. Is there any chance that that might ever happen in Ohio? I don't think it'll happen this century. <laughs> oh, we, barely, we can barely register online. You know, we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I vote in New Mexico, as I said before, and they make it so easy. I go from go to vote from abroad.org. I fill out my FPCA. I can wow. take a picture of my signature, sign it. 
it automatically goes to um, the county clerk in Bernalillo County. They immediately send me a notification that they've received my FPCA 45 days before election. I get my ballot, I fill it out, I scan it, I send it back by email. And so many states are doing that now. That's and great. there are still, you know, so many that will not accept it by email. And um, I think it should be a national change. But sorry to hear Ohio can't just push that through and enact it next week. But, you know, I think that's it'll a be great next idea. Week. I'll certainly share it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Next up, we have Christina. Hi there. I just want to share with you, I was at the Board of Elections the other day. They're handed out, I don't know if you can see this, information on how to get a free ID. So that's at least good. Um, mm -hmm. And it did say, I mean, it does say what, what um, Art was alluding to, that it's people who, like us, can still return our ballot by using the last four digits of our Social Security or using our driver's license number or a photo ID take a copy of a photo ID. Of course, most of us living overseas don't have a photo ID. But I also went to a rally yesterday from uh, Protect Choice in Ohio. And you can't actually go on any corner right now in Cleveland without being bombarded by people getting you to sign the petition. And when I was at the rally yesterday with uh, Mayor Bibb, we were asked if we would be interesting, interested in joining to co-sponsor the Ohio Physicians and the Reproductive Right Pack, um, if Ohioans abroad would be interested in doing that. Adding our name to their, and I said I would bring it up at some point. I don't know, maybe that's something for our team meeting, not necessarily for this meeting. And I also was going to bring it up with the Reproductive Justice Team uh, for the Global Women's Caucus. It's, it's yeah, to see what, legal repercussions we might have. But since I, we had Art on the call, who's our vice chair, our global vice chair, I thought he might have some, some thoughts on weighing in on that. Yay, awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Karen, you're up. Um, I wanted to clarify one thing and then ask a question. Uh, Connie or Zach, either one. UOCAVA law is a federal law. It gives us the right to vote in federal elections whatever state we're in. But if I understood Connie right, um, we don't have any protections for state law. Like they could disallow us even completely voting in any of the state and down ballot elections. Am I correct? They could go backwards. From, uh, from, from your statement, that's, I would agree with you. With you. Uh, I don't know of any any effort to keep people from voting other than this one is going to be pretty effective, but um, I think you're right. Yeah, I, I have a feeling that they're working on incremental changes. Um, so my, my question was too, and perhaps it's premature, but how can Democrats abroad, is there a legal, uh, ethical way for us to reach out to military voters who are not members of Democrats abroad, but potential Democrats, so that at least they get the kind of hectoring information that we send out to our civilian members and the few military members that we have about voting as soon as you get that ballot 45 days before so that it has time to get back and, and so forth. There's no way that I know uh, that we can get a list of who's serving where. However, there are different media that you can use to reach them, such as the Military Times, Air Force Times, um, Stars and Stripes, those are all online newspapers now. You know, 100 years ago when I was in, we only had paper newspapers, but pretty much everybody read it. But, and so I assume that the young, Zach will tell us, he knows, because I- Well, you know, I, <laughs> this is a bit of a labor intensive thing on behalf of the DNC, but you could look so all boards of election in the state of Ohio have to publish the mailing addresses of the ballots where they go. So you could pull a list of individuals that requested ballots 
abroad in 2022, and then marry that up against uh, updated contact information that the DNC maintains in Built Builder. So there's a there's a data heavy approach to finding this answer as well. But Tony's correct. Um, direct access to overseas stationed or deployed service members and their contact information is not public record. So you would have to go through indirect channels to, to find that. Um, that being said, uh, through UCAVA and uh, other State Department and DOD voter education programs, there are supposed to be voter information officers at every major installation and even in port operating installations around the world. So there is an approach that would be, again, I think maybe a coordinated effort that would be required, but um, there are supposed to be individuals that you can contact at like Rammstein, for example, that would be able to um, be conduits of, con uh, of information for, for stationed abroad uh, service members um, for enfranchisement, for you know voter registration, but then also absentee ballot education. and. Uh, I will just say uh, as a personal and personal experience, um, the this stuff ebbs and flows based on the, the year. Presidential years are pretty good at this stuff. Midterm elections, less so. Odd year elections, yeah, okay. Kind of on your own there. Um, so I, uh, it's definitely a worthwhile approach, but um, I, I would just have to say that you're, you're looking at taking this on multiple, multiple strategies to kind of Get to a concentration of voters to bring the awareness to the to these issues for sure. Definitely something that we might want to look into. So thank you to both of you for that. Hi. Um, sorry, I'll turn my video on. Um, thank you for hosting this. This has been really informative. Um, I just wanted to ask. I know that given the shortened um, physical mail deadline. Um, I mean, it's great that in Ohio we can receive our ballot by email, so that expedites the process in terms of us being able to receive our ballot, um, but obviously we have to physically mail our ballot back in order for it to be counted. Um, in other states, they actually uh, allow you to email the ballot or fax the ballot back. Is it is it, it is something on the table, or is are there any discussions about being able to either email or fax the ballot uh, to return the ballot and have it be counted? None that I've heard. It perhaps that might be a um, a better solution um, in order yeah, to help. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it with my state rep, my state representative. Yeah, I I did at one point. I'm sorry. I think it was like five years ago. I contacted my state rep about that. Um, but I just personally didn't have time to pursue it. <laughs> um, yeah. But I definitely think it is um, something that would be good um, for for us to look into. Yeah, I agree. Great, I agree. thank you so much, Rebecca. We have Christine Anderson with a question. Yeah, it, uh, so I'm a phone banker, and uh, mo it, by inter by national law, you have to get the the ballots out 45 days before the election. And I've never seen cases where the ballot was not sent out 45 days before. That, uh, so the actual, uh, I, okay, the actual problem of getting them back on time is, is general for all the countries that are all over the place. In Europe, it's not really a problem, but, but it's a huge problem anyway. And the only thing they can do basically is if they have to send it by mail, is to uh, send it by courier, international courier. It, it, it's interesting that she said it cost, he said that cost 60, 60 arrows somewhere, and, and, and here it costs 25, okay. But I've advised so many people to send them in by, by, um, by international courier just because it's the only thing that's, that's you know, that's secure. So um, there's also a kind of a, special um, ballot, provisional ballot, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the FWAB, the FWAB, which is used to be the, the backup ballot, mm -hmm. if, you, if your ballot, real ballot didn't get there on time. And you can fill that out, and we've done that. As soon as you get your, uh, you, you can, as, as a lot before, you know, 
you have to send it in by mail, but you can send it before you arrive, your, your actual ballot arrives. It's a little weird because you have to write in the ca candidates' uh, names or just say Democratic all the, the way left. But we've, we've done that a lot, you know, just telling people to use this fraud. Uh, none of this is a solution to what you're talking about because, you know, if it's not practical, if it's not just, it isn't. You know, we have to try and change all these things. But uh, about half of the states still use mail, mail, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ballot sending in. That's all. <laughs> Just as a note on, on the process to get your ballot back for military uh, people serving overseas, we do have an army post office and in fact, the uh, the reserve unit that runs the post office is just here in the Cincinnati area. So a lot of those members live and work here in their civilian jobs. And then if there's something going on like Afghanistan, Iraq, et cetera, they deploy for six months at a time and run the post office mm -hmm. for our service members. And so it comes back, the mail comes back on a military plane we only have to use a regular American first class stamp. What is that? 58 cents now. So it's it's um but but it still takes seven to ten days to get to its US destination. So obviously that's a different situation than what you're talking about, but um I've been educated with uh, today about some of these issues and I'll definitely share it with with the people ben. that I know who are still in office. Good. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Okay, we have one final question today. It's gonna to be from Dawn. I had the impression, I, I read somewhere on that Frank LaRose really wasn't all that keen on the fact that the military voters are overseas are, uh, you know, having less time to vote and all that. But I, it, it was, am I right about that? And can he do anything to sort of help the situation or change the situation? And I'm also wondering, um, on the, that's one part of my question. The other one is that the, the, we talk about 45 days. Uh, they have to, federal law says they have to be, get, get there for at least 45 days beforehand. Could, could it be possible in Ohio that they say, okay, we made a little bit of a mistake here by putting so much pressure on the, on the you know, military and overseas, but, uh, but we keep the ballots out to them quicker. Is that a possibility? Well, anything's possible in the universe of universe of possibilities. <laughs> but, so, for, first on on Frank's Frank LaRose, Secretary LaRose's position, he was completely supportive of the bill. He testified in support of the of the final version of House Bill four fifty eight. He held press conferences and he refuted criticism by saying, "Well, I just invite you all to you know my critics to partner with me, so this works well." <laughs> and of course, we've been trying to, but he doesn't answer us. Right, so okay. his position is to totally support it. He served in the army. So he it's clearly, um, he's running for the, the U.S. Senate. So he's got a, he's got a lurch to the right to, uh, mm -hmm. to okay. the primary. And that's much more important to him right. than the duties uh, to which he swore an oath. Mm -hmm. So the second thing, his efforts to correct, well, he could correct it with, Voter education, you can't correct it with voter yeah. education, but he can issue directives um, mm, right. to mm -hmm. boards of election saying, I want you to send these out earlier. And, and mm. he can include something with each with each ballot that says you have to, you should mail it by this day because otherwise we won't count, count it. So, but he won't do that because he's yeah. busy raising money for his U.S. Senate right. bid and that's taking all of his time right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's disappointing, but now I understand better. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Connie, sorry. Sorry. if you wouldn't mind, we actually have just one more person dying to ask a question, if that's okay with you. Great, then Miguel? Hey, yeah. Miguel. Uh, hi, Connie, so, so, so nice to, uh, to see you. Um, we Let's try to end on a positive note, okay? Uh, most Democrats are now doom and gloom on, on the state of democracy. What hopeful message can you tell us before we end this call? Uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Miguel, because I have been waking up in the middle of the night with my stomach tied in knots over the growing autocracy in Ohio. 
and the lack yeah. of the, the destructive, the destruction of democracy in Ohio. However, what we are seeing is that young people, particularly people your age, are very up in arms with the state of affairs and they're getting involved in ways we never expected and we've never seen before. Uh, we went to, we had a, um, a rally, I guess when, when Roe v. Wade was overturned and we registered 200 new voters and they were all under the age of 25. They had all gone to that rally. They were up in arms, they were excited. I'm also seeing young people um, being very concerned about other issues that we Democrats generally like, like you know, having clean drinking water and not being able to see brown stuff in the air, you know, just having a clean environment to live in. And this voting rights, you know, unfortunately, voting rights has never been a successful issue for a campaign. And um, we, you know, I've I've run eight campaigns and, and we've done the polling at least when I was actively running, even though those were some of my issues, they were never um, never something you could run a campaign on. However, people are, the, the newspapers around the state are against these actions. The newspapers around the state, their editorial boards are coming out and issuing editorials opposing this measure. The four, there's, there are 140 organizations that have come together to oppose this attack on democracy that's going to the August ballot. Uh, and as, as Zach said, all four living previous governors have come out against it. So I don't know, um, I don't know why the current governor is eager to sign it. He doesn't need to sign it for it to get on the ballot, but he says he will. So, all right, I know you're gonna end up. So the, the point is we got young people like you and we've got a re-energized Democratic Party and a bunch of independents who hate the GOP. So I think that's going to be our hope for the future. And that is an amazing note to end on. Connie Pillage, Zach Roberts, thank you both so much for joining us today, for sharing what's happening on the other side back home in Ohio. Um, and keeping us up to date because we are very active. Um, we are turning out the votes. We are connecting everywhere we can to make sure that overseas voters understand that they do have the right to vote, that they need to be voting, and that their vote is making a difference um, for everyone back in Ohio and for ourselves as Ohioans and as military families uh, and service members living overseas. Thank you so much for being here. A That's couple quick pleasure. notes. Thank you, sorry. Um, a couple really quick notes. Um, again, all of these links are available in the chat. They will also be added to the notes uh, for our video. Once it is edited, we will be posting that and you can see there's a YouTube play link that is listed at the bottom. And this video will be available once Angela has had a chance to work her magic on it. Um, of course, if you have not registered to vote yet, you can still do so at votefromabroad.org, not for the May 2nd election in Ohio, but for the general election, uh, because local elections matter just as much as the sexy national and statewide elections. So please make sure not only are you registering to vote, but you're reminding your loved ones back home that they also need to be registering and turning out the vote themselves. So again, thank you so much everyone for taking the time and special thanks also for the Veterans and Military Family Caucus and to the Ohio State team uh, for turning out and putting together this event. Yeah, thank you everyone. Have a great day, take care. Go Buckeyes. <laughs>